so coming to the maxillary cancers uh, i am dr amit kesri and uh, asim has already introduced me so i will straight forward go to the my presentation so uh, lecture over, overview is this that we will discuss some relevant anatomy work up and investigation what are the different histologies we face in our day to day practice and approach to the management so coming to the anatomy we all know that it is a box maxillary sinus is the box separate structures and superiorly we have orbit uh, posteriorly we have the pterygo palatine and infratemporal fossa and uh, if we go medially we have the pterygoid process and inferiorly we have the alveolar process and there are uh, a nerve inferior orbital nerve which is important maybe sometime involved in uh, if you go down if you go on to the medial side we have the ethmoid sinus and the nasal cavity so this is important and once we remove it uh, then posteriorly we have coena where the tumors go or into the uh, pterygoid muscles so uh, this is the confines beyond the confines of the maxillary sinus just for the revision then coming to the maxillary sinus revision with the orbit we have to understand that in the orbit uh, the two walls which are uh, intermingled with the maxillary sinus is the inferior and the medial wall and in the inferior and medial wall uh, the orbital periosteum is the first structure so the first structure orbital periosteum is uh, a tough barrier for malignancies from maxillary sinus to go into the uh, orbit but if it that is breached then the next layer is fat and after that the muscles comes so it is important that when you are planning your uh, um, uh, maxillary sinus you see that what is the involvement of orbit and for orbit uh, the the mri is the better investigations coming to the bony anatomy we all know that there is a, a orbital fissure superior and inferior greater and later wing of sphenoid and then on the medial wall Uh, we have the lamina papyracea and again the orbital periosteum which needs to be very very important for our management so maxillary sinus cancer usually present between age group 4 to 6 decade but yes some of the tumor pediatric tumors present early especially the rhabdomyosarcomas and early cancer can find to maxilla usually have minimal or no symptom that's why the patient when present to us would have a extensive disease mainly 3 3 t4 disease T1, T2 diseases are very less. Uh, it can cause nasal symptom depending upon the extension, uh, alveolar process, dental, orbit, orbital symptom, and intracranial symptoms. If it goes through the pterygoid or through the one of the uh, uh, fossa, like uh, foramen ovale and other areas into the intracranial. Nodal stress is less common, but if if, uh, if it all if it is there, then it is level two and some mandibular lymph nodes. And metastasis is rare. but yes it has to be kept in mind in extensive disease and especially adenoid cystic carcinoma and uh, other malignancies so if it goes into the nasal cavity usual nasal symptom we all know medullary effusion is is important excision tube blockage and if it goes to the intracranial fossa it have may have some intracranial symptom in the maxillary sinus it may present as mass ulceration of skin paresthesia trismus and pain loosening of teeth or some uh, ulcers in the hard palate in the ethmoid sinus we have already discussed about the orbital symptom proptosis chemosis and visual loss because of the close proximity to the orbit coming to the clinical examination and work up uh, the it start with the inspection so you have to inspect the skin over the maxillary sinus what is the status it is color is the same or there is a color change you have to pinch the skin uh, with the uh, maxillary sinus tumor that the skin is pinchable or it is freely mobile over it the orbital examination is very important especially regarding proptosis or any chemosis or any uh, uh, the movement of the recti muscle uh, like uh, medial rectus involvement is quite common and the inferior rectus movement if there is a orbital excentration oral cavity examination is very important you have to see the hard palate you have to see the uh, alveolar process the gingiva upper gingiva and gingiva buccal sulcus because these all areas can have uh, the uh, extension of the maxillary sinus tumor 
nasal endoscopy is important to know that what is the stasis of medial wall or the um, middle turbinate or the ethmoid sinuses. Uh, biopsy is important investigation, but uh, the if there is a suspicion of malig uh, malignancy and if radiology is not done, uh, the radiology should be done first before the biopsy. We'll talk uh, about the biopsy, which is the most important investigation, and it is vital for both management and the prognostication of the uh, disease to the patient, depending upon what kind of biopsy it is. Histopathological diagnosis aid also aid in selection of treatment that uh, what kind of uh, treatment, although the major is sinus, the primary treatment is uh, the surgery, but sometimes newer given therapy. Hey, Hello. Am I audible? Sorry. Yeah, please continue. Uh, I yes, think yes. some disturbances. Okay. So uh, the important point is a negative biopsy does not rule out the diagnosis. Many a time if the biopsy is done from the nasal cavity and it has lined mucosa or the secondary changes happen, then it should be repeated before uh, stamping it as to be a benign disease. And deep endoscopic biopsy from maxillary interim is a good diagnostic yield. What we do that uh, we see the radiology and the enhancing part, uh, which is enhancing the tumor part, we try to take the uh, biopsy from that area. And after two biopsy has not been uh, enough, you can do intraop frozen or uh, square cytology to see. And also keep in mind the invasive fungal infection. They usually mimic malignancies. The only thing is that the patients are a little bit younger, very well preserved even in advance. Uh, we will see the case example as we come along. Coming to the radiology, if it is limited to the maxilla, we can get away with the CT scan if there is no orbital involvement. Uh, uh, like in this case, it is a tumor is mainly into the confine of the maxilla. It is involving the inferior orbital wall, but it's not going into the orbit. But uh, the inferior uh, wall of the maxilla, that is the alveolar process, is involved, and th there may be a swelling intraoral bulge also. This is advanced cystic carcinoma. But the tumor is involving the 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 orbit, and if it is there is no good planes. And then uh, MRI is very useful in investigation to see the real extent of disease into the orbit. Is it only the periorbita or the muscles are involved or the dura? Less than 5 millimeter of extension to the dura, then there may be the dural involvement. And uh, although in dural involvement in maxillary sinus is in the very late stages, but yes, it do sometime involve the maxillary uh, cancers. So, like this is a case of a maxillary here. You can see that there is some skin uh, so, uh, swelling. We can see that there is an ulcer on the upper alveolus. And uh, if we see the CT scan, in CT scan, we need to require both soft tissue and bone window because bone window is so the bony erosion. So, we have, uh, you can see that the subtle bony erosion here, uh, if you compare from the right side and the left side, and then there is a soft tissue swelling here. So this is all the maxilla may seem uh, pretty uh, not well. So it is basically uh, arising from the this uh, alveolus, but involving the maxillary sinus and going uh, and the, on the uh, periosteum, following the periosteum, the interior wall. So you have to uh, examine the patient fully and a nasal endoscopic examination adds to the diagnosis. The patient, we can see that had no proptosis, no chemosis but uh, that may sometime be involved. So this is another case. Uh, uh, you can see that the tumor, uh, the maxillary sinus is, the wall is eroded. The inferior orbital wall is eroded and it and this is inside the, the maxillary sinus uh, with erosion of the walls and there is some extension into the ethmoid sinuses. So according to the symptom sign and radiology, you have to consider. And again, this is a recurrent case. Uh, this is a very, uh, very extensive case, recurrent uh, adenoid cystic carcinoma. So you can say apart from the maxilla, the orbit is involved. There even the dura is involved and more than five millimeter of involvement is there. A scaly, uh, a skull base is involved, the pterygoids are involved and then it is going into the cavernous sinus. So this is adenoid cystic carcinoma. Here you have to see if you really can operate with a good margins. Uh, the other thing is that sometimes uh, the, the tumor look uh, uh, malignant, but uh, repeated biopsy, if it is showing that 
to biopsies, uh, then we go ahead with surgery. Otherwise, we try to for a tissue diagnosis. So this was a case of infected AC polyp, which uh, looked like a malignancy. And it was referred as a malignant case, but it was an infected AC polyp, which we could uh, identify. And then although we did an oncological surgery, in this case, we removed the entire uh, rinkers and everything was cleared. Uh, but uh, the intraoperative also was of a benign tumor, no malignant cells present. Uh, then comes uh, some uh, case which uh, may stump it. So here we can also do, here they, we can see there is a, a lot of skin involvement. So what we do is now we are following is that we do FNSC investigation, FNSC as investigation before taking a biopsy. And the FNSC has proven that this is a invasive aspergillosis, which is uh, quite uh, common in uh, this part of North India, especially Punjab and uh, UP. Uh, all uh, agricultural belt uh, areas, Haryana, uh, invasive aspergillosis in a human or competent patient. So sometimes uh, the patient uh, has to be, the tissue diagnosis is very, very important. And if it is coming to skin uh, uh, and, uh, um, and sublabial area, uh, FNSC is also a good investigation before you go and go biopsy if it, the yield is negative. So uh, most frequently involved mag uh, is maxillary sinus and nasal cavity. Most common types are squamous cell carcinomas. Sinusal and differentiated carcinoma usually involve the nasal cavity, but they also sometimes involve the maxillary sinus. The others are chondro adeno adenocystic carcinoma. Classification: I will not go into details. Uh, uh, I will just touch upon the TNM classification, which is really important. So TX is the primary tumor which cannot be assessed. So we, ha we have to find out that which area is the tumor is. And it is the T4A and T4B. Till here, we can operate easily with uh, modern. Here, we may need extended maxillectomy to remove the areas from the pterygoid, till the pterygoids and the ethmoid sinus. But th these are the area where you have to see that this may be the extensive. And do we give to give, give any neoadjuvant therapy before we operate? Because if you have margins positive tumor, then there is no point operating. And sometimes we may have to do the craniofacial resection for these cases, especially T4A and T4B. Uh, this is the histological, uh, different histologies. Uh, there are a lot many histologies which are there in the malignant, uh, but this commercial carcinoma, adenoid, adenoid cystic carcinoma, and adenocarcinoma are important from the maxillary point of view. And the uh, other is uh, we see rhabdomyosarcoma, chondrosarcoma, sarcoma is again rare. So these are the tumors that uh, which we encounter in our daily practice. Escomer cell carcinoma by far is uh, most common. And uh, degree of differentiation determine the treatment well to moderately differentiated surgical and medical oncological treatment, poorly undifferentiated, if a lot of uh, extension to skull base and dura and uh, orbital involvement, then you can uh, consider regarding chemo radiation. And uh, uh, it, it is poorly undifferentiated with extensive or even without nodal metastasis have poor prognosis. And the other, other poor prognosis is the bilateral cervical node metastasis. So this is a typical uh, um, uh, SQMS cell carcinoma with eroding the interior wall and the medial wall. The septum may be preserved here, but the posterior wall, there is uh, erosion of the part of the posterior wall. And this is the pterygoid. And here the tumor is going almost to the pterygoids. So if we remove here from maxillectomy, we might need to drill the pterygoid completely to posterior part of the tumor. Uh, the other issue with squamous cell carcinoma is that inverted papilloma, when it is recurrent and there is a lot of bony erosion, then you suspect and you send uh, multiple tissues for biopsy because many have the part of it goes into the divider. So you have to be very careful that uh, on the enhancing area, you have to send for biopsy. And if it is, uh, if you are able to remove it completely, you can observe patient or sometimes the radiotherapy needs to be given. Uh, adenoid cystic carcinoma is the most common type of the SSC. Maxillary sinus and uh, nasal cavity are one. It, it consists of three different uh, sub-histologies like tubular cribriform and solid. Neural spread is very, very common to the in inferior orbital nerve. 
and cavernous sinus uh, is commonly involved and uh, uh, extends into cavernous sinus must be ruled in uh, adenoid cystic carcinoma. Otherwise, uh, within a matter of two or three months, the tumor may involve the cavernous sinus. And, and the NGO invasion is also uh, so with adenoid cystic carcinoma. Recurrence at local size and distance size are common within three years, like the case I have shown with the extensive orbit and skull base involvement, including the cavernous sinus. Adenocarcinoma is the third most common cancer, mainly involve the nasal cavity, but uh, involve the medial maxillary wall. They are salivary and non-salivary types. Non-salivary are further classified into intestinal and non-intestinal. Uh, the sinonasal intestinal type occur in woodworkers. We typically see the carpenters presenting to us with uh, sinonasal mass, usually in the nasal cavity, but sometimes the medial wall is involved of the maxilla. And uh, sinonasal uh, ITC are mostly low grade, but sometimes high grade is there, uh, and which is a little poor prognosis than compared to the low grade. Rhabdomyosarcoma is in pediatric and young adults. Uh, the differential diagnosis sometimes is juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. Uh, so uh, the only difference is the contrast enhancement and the widening of the spinopatine foramen a little different. This is also slow growing and vascular lesion. And it has different variety. Embryonal variety is more common in the pediatric, alveolar, pleomorphic, and in spindle cell types. So rare histology are sinonasal and differentiated carcinomas, lymphoma, malignant melanoma, and chondrose sarcoma. So these are less commonly seen in the maxillary sinus, but yes, uh, at the high volume center, you see cases. So just few of the examples. This is sinonasal and differentiated carcinoma involving the part of the orbit with intraorbital and uh, this. So here it uh, combined uh, tumor board discussion is done. I will come to it. And then again, this is a, a, a adenocarcinoma extensive one involving the this uh, the orbit tense. So approach to the management, this, this is my final thing, is the biopsy extent of tumor. Discussion in multiplicity tumor board with oncology team and uh, radiology and uh, the uh, sur surgery team and possibly a radiologist is a very good. Surgery is the main step of management excision with margin in block, which is for uh, most of the uh, squamous cell carcinomas. Neurogiven therapy is uh, given for uh, margin to get good margins around the skull base orbit and uh, minimal in skin involvement. Uh, Post-op chemoradiotherapy is usually needed. So uh, the flow chart is that you do endoscopy and uh, imaging, and then after imaging, you do a biopsy. I think I've already talked about it. And then depending upon the tumor board and the histology, uh, everything is decided that the patient will go in which arm, and there is switching over to the other arm, depending upon the extent. So uh, my surgical tips is that I have already, I cannot stress more than that is the combined treatment plan, planning with tumor board. Open surgery is better suited for maxillary sinus cancer. Endoscopic surgery is only possible in limited medial and interior wall involvement. Go one layer more than the in, involved structures. Involved ones should always be drilled because the, the radiation therapy did not work on the involved one. Debulking the uh, tumor if you are doing an endoscopic approach, uh, to clear the coina first to avoid coinal venting effect so that the uh, bleeding goes into the nasal cavity, although it does not apply to the open approaches. So uh, endoscopic surgery has very limited role uh, in the maxillary sinus can cancers and uh, uh, only medial wall of the maxilla can be very well removed. If the rest of the walls are involved, the open surgery suits better. And uh, open uh, the partial surgery is like partial maxillectomy, uh, which may be inferior partial maxillectomy or the medial maxillectomy. Total maxillectomy is the surgery which we do for the squamous carcinomas most of the time, unless the inferior wall is completely free, which is less likely. And then uh, uh, Weber Ferguson incision or the later anatomy, depending upon what is the extent. Extended maxillectomy means involve uh, removal of uh, tumor from the ethmoid sinuses and the pterygoid and the other uh, sphenopalatine infratemporal fossa. Incision uh, uh, endoscopic is very limited. Mainly the workhorse is Weber for Sometimes mid-phase degloving, uh, we also do mid-phase degloving 
for tumors. So this is a tumor uh, which uh, the radiology I have already seen that it is involving this. So we 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 decided for the uh, uh, the infrastructure maxillectomy in this case, and we were able to achieve that the maxilla was removed, uh, preserving the orbital wall as it was uh, uh, not involved. But again, after the removal of tumor, we we, we removed the uh, the inferior orbital uh, rim and then leave, left the periosteum intact because one layer more is always good, you get good margins. So this was the specimen which uh, we could remove and we, we always get a palatal obturator so that the patient are able to eat. In almost all the cases, we are able to get a, a palatal obturator so that, uh, that you don't have to put a sponge there and the healing is better. The patient is, has good feel good factor after that. Again, uh, uh, total maxillectomy, so uh, good uh, flap, and you have to always palpate the flap for any involvement and then take that, that area if there is an involve. The skin is always palpated and the, the MRI is better investigation to see what kind of level is involved. And then you do a uh, total maxillectomy. Uh, pterygoid area has to be drilled uh, with, uh, 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 taken with the heavy gauze and then removed. Uh, you can use a orbital protector or you can use a spoon if you do not have one in your work. Uh, just a, 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 a small video to show that how we do the mid face degloving. So it is from uh, uh, this to this, but this has very limited uh, uh, if the interior wall. We can do all remove all the wall, but if one piece removal, then sometimes it is difficult with this. Uh, I'm just showing it just for the resident that intercartilage is on both sides and then the transfixation is season. And then you elevate the entire mid face can be elevated and the entire maxilla is visible and you can do this is for the benign tumor. So I will not go into the details of it. Then sometime rare pathology is like uh, this is a case of pandosarcoma. Again, we, it, it has a soft tissue component, so we diagnose with the FNSC itself. Sometimes we may require a small biopsy, but many a time we are able to resume. So here we remove the tumor with uh, 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 with our neurosurgery colleague, and then we did a wide currentomy, remove the tumor in entirely, and then uh, 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 a radiotherapy was given. This uh, patient has tumor-free survival for four years, and then again, again operated and then uh, given radiotherapy, uh, seven-year follow-up. This is a mesenchymal tumor, uh, low, uh, it, it was a low grade. So uh, we went, it was mainly involving the tumoid and uh, the, it's a low, uh, slow growing tumor. So we went for endoscopic approach. This is almost a five years that patient was fine. Uh, again, adenocarcinoma operated outside, medial wall was involved, but the superior thing was left. And uh, after this, uh, we, we went ahead, there was general involvement, so we dissected the dura. And uh, this is the post-op, uh, after the adjuvant therapy, almost uh, two year post-op, uh, everything is fine. This is the dural repair, which we have kept here. So with this, I will end my presentation. If there is any questions, we can take as we progress in the webinar. Thank you, Dr. Amit. Uh, thank you for such a wonderful, comprehensive and elaborate presentation, which included all the histologies and surgical approaches and management of maxillary tumors. Thank you. Uh, all the questions we'll uh, uh, address in the end of the session. Uh, right now, I think we should move on to the case discussion. The case discussion, for case discussion, I would like to invite Dr. P. Arun, a senior consultant, uh, head of surgery, Tata Memorial Center, Kolkata. Sir, are you there? Hi, hi. Hi, sir. Hello, sir. Uh, Dean. Are you able to? Y yes, sir. We are able to hear. Yes. Ah, great, great, great. Then, uh, Dr. Ravi Mahal, he is Director Professor uh, ENT and Head and Neck Surgery at uh, Modernizer Medical College, New Delhi. Hello, sir. Hi, Hello, sir. hi Doctor. Hi, sir. Ravi, how are you? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, sir has been my teacher also. Uh, welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Here. Then I would like to invite Dr. Kaveri Kaketi, Associate Professor, Head and Neck Surgery, B. Balwa Cancer Institute, Guwahati. 
Dr. Kaveri. Yeah, hi. Hi. And then uh, Dr. Hitesh, uh, he is consultant head and neck surgery at Fortis Hospital, Mulund, Mumbai. Hi, Dr. Ravi. Thank you for having me here. Hi, Dr. Uh, Dr. Amit, we would also like to you also to be on the panel for uh, case discussion. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now I would like to invite Dr. Kirti for the case discussion on maxillary sinus. Please Hope go ahead, Kirti. Sure. Uh, good evening. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, the case, uh, my case for today is a 48-year-old female housewife presented with chief complaints of swelling in left cheek since four months and uh, with ulceration and pus discharge for past one month. Uh, left nasal obstruction was there for three months and left oral ulceration for two months. Patient was apparently well four months back when she noticed a swelling in left cheek, which was insidious in onset, gradually progressive in nature, initially a size of chickpea, uh, but now has progressed to the present size, so much so that it involves the inner part of the left eye for past one month. There is also ulceration and pus discharge over the swelling since one month. Swelling was associated with pain, uh, which was also insidious in onset, initially dull aching in character, uh, gradually progressive and patient complains of increased pain for, uh, for past one month. History of left-sided nasal obstruction is there, which is also in serious and onset, progressive in nature, and has now progressed to completely obstruct the left side of the nasal cavity for past one month. Also, there is history of associated left nasal mass uh, for two months, uh, presently filling the entire left nose. History of left nasal discharge for two months, uh, which is whitish in color, sticky in consistency, occasionally blood stain, and no aggravating or relieving factors. And there is also history of decreased smell perception for, for past one month due to nasal mass. Patient complains of left-sided oral ulceration for past two months, which involves the upper teeth. Uh, associated with occasional bleeding from the oral mass and is associated with pain and tooth loosening. And there is history of left eye watery discharge since one month. No history of protrusion of eye, double vision or blurry taste. No history of um, reduced mouth opening or restricted jaw movements. No history of any ear discharge, ear pain or decreased hearing. No history of mouth breathing or snoring, headache, vomiting, or dizziness. No history of neck swelling or fever. No history suggestive of distant metastasis like cuff, blood and sputum, abdominal pain or swelling or wound pains. No history of weight loss or decreased appetite. Coming to personal history. Uh, Dr. Kirti, um, yeah. can you just elaborate on the, I mean, uh, give your justification for the negative histories you have taken? Uh, no history of protrusion of eye, double vision uh, indicates that there is no uh, optic nerve involvement or no extraocular muscle invol involvement. Uh, there is no history of decreased vision, uh, suggests optic nerve involvement. Uh, no history of loss of sensation over the face, suggests there is no history of trigeminal nerve involvement, branches of the trigeminal nerve. No history of loss of taste is again due to the lingual nerve, which is a branch of the uh, trigeminal nerve. No history of decreased mouth opening indicates that there is no uh, pterygo, uh, there is no trismus, there is no uh, pterygoid involvement or no history of restricted jaw movements like there is no involvement of masseter, lateral pterygoid muscles which are supplied by the mandibular branch. No history of ear discharge, pain or decreased hearing indicate that uh, in a sinonasal case if uh, to, uh, disease extends to the nasopharynx can cause blockage of the eustachian mm -hmm. tube leading to uh, pain or decreased hearing and no history of mouth breathing and snoring is again due to the nasopharynx extension. No history of headache, vomiting and dizziness indicate intracranial involvement. Yeah, no uh, Kirti, yeah, may yeah, just yeah, sort yeah. of, you know, a reduced mouth opening is very unlikely due to nerve involvement because the pterygoid, the, pterygoid it's muscle usually the apparatus you know the muscular apparatus is involved if the nerve is involved you would have loss of sensation over the face 
Yes, sir. Right? Said, they are not in water. Sense. So which division of the maxillary would be here? It will be the V2, right? Yes. And that is sensory. So when you attribute uh, reduced mouth opening, it won't be due to nerve involvement. Rather, it would be due to direct infiltration of the muscles of mastication or involvement of the masticatory space in your case. Right? Yes. And snoring again need not be obstruction of the nasopharynx. Any bilateral oh, nasal obstruction. Even a unilateral mask can push the septum to the other side and cause obstruction and snoring. So please don't yes. commit that it's because of nasopharyngeal obstruction. It could be due to nasal obstruction as, as, as uh, much as a nasopharyngeal obstruction. Uh, another important point, are you done with your history? Please go on. Uh, I, I, yes. I should have interrupted you once again once you finish your history. Okay. Go ahead. A hmm. uh, patient I had history of chewing tobacco with betel nut for past 15 years, which she quitted two months back. There is no history of alcohol intake, uh, no history of TB, diabetes, hypertension, asthma, or jaundice, no history of previous surgery or known drug allergies. Right. So you have finished your history. And one of the most important uh, sort of, since you are jumping into a conclusion that this is a malignancy, it like your your. The, the picture of the patient just shouts out to us. Yes, you're dealing with a malignancy. But you heard Dr. Kesari speak that, you know, they may mm -hmm. even be, a, a, it must be a, maybe a fungal infection. So some predisposing factors like immunosuppression, use of steroids, your history of asthma is right. But if you had clarified that the patient is not taking oral steroids, probably HIV, presence uh, with, with nasal mass, you know, Kaposi's sarcoma over that area. So that things that you are thinking in a more comprehensive way and the examiner would, you know, really give you kudos for that, that you're not just thinking of a malignancy, there could be a lot of inflammatory conditions which you could also present with, with a picture like that, right? Even with a short yeah. history of four months. Go ahead. Uh, uh, one uh, one more point. Uh, yeah, please uh, go ahead, Dr. Ravi. Please go ahead. Dr. Uh, Kirti, yes, uh, you told about the uh, palatal ulceration patient had sorry had patient had oral ulceration so where it was actually i mean it was sir in the palate uh, heart palate that you have not system. told uh, ki whether it was in the palate you told that it was uh, in the teeth so teeth cannot have ulceration no no i uh, sir i said that it was associated with tooth loosening uh, actually that i have included in the examination part but uh, definitely in history you could have told the uh, oral ulceration which part of the uh, oral cavity was having ulceration the palate or the soft palate okay sir kirti uh, dr hitesh here are we missing on the occupational history sir a uh, patient was actually housewife Especially in uh, cyanonasal or yes, maxillary tumors, why is occupational history important? Because uh, especially uh, wood workers, uh, carpenters, textile industry workers, nickel workers have a high predisposition to cyanonasal cancers. And it is an occupational related cancer majorly. So that so is absolutely. important. So if, if the patient is a wood worker or is working in nickel chromium industries, what kind of carcinoma are you expecting in maxilla? Sir, uh, if uh, in hard wood dust, uh, we'll expect a, a adenocarcinoma. In soft wood, we'll expect a squamous cell carcinoma. So absolutely. It's a very important history. Good, good. Go on, please. Uh, General physical examination. My patient was moderately built, ECOG 1, a uh, conscious oriented, uh, well oriented to time place person. Pulse was 92 per minute regular rhythmic. BP was 130 80 mm of mercury measured at level of heart. No pallor, icterus, cyanosis, clubbing, generalized lymphadenopathy, or tidal edema. Oh, sorry. This is a, these are the clinical photographs of the patient. On inspection, uh, there was irregular swelling of approximately 5 into 3 centimeter on left side of the face, extending superomedially up to the medial canthus of left eye, involving left nasal cavity medially, inferiorly extending from the left ala, involving left half of the upper lip uh, up to the angle of the mouth, and laterally 3 centimeter horizontally from the left ala. 
Also, there was a ill-defined ulceration of 2 into 1.5 centimeter present over the involved skin, just lateral to the left ala, associated with pus discharge with surrounding blackish discoloration and induration of the skin. Left periorbital edema was seen. Left nasal cavity was obstructed completely with pale reddish uh, a nasal mass, which uh, was coming till the anterior nares, and sticky mucoid discharge were present on the nasal mass. On intraoral examination, mouth opening was adequate. On inspection, there was a fullness in left upper gingival buccal sulcus. 4 into 2.5 centimeter ulcero proliferative growth was present in left side of the upper alveolus. Uh, and hard palate uh, extending from the right lateral incisor to the left last upper lower, upper molar, uh, crossing midline anteriorly and posteriorly 2.5 centimeter lateral to midline. Rest of the oral cavity was uh, within normal limits. In neck, there was no swelling visible in the neck. Uh, you should also examine the ear, ear also. Uh, yes, sir, I've done in uh, palpation, okay. I have done. Okay. On palpation, I uh, inspectory findings were confirmed. Swelling was almost the same as on inspection, uh, except for it was uh, tender on palpation, firm to hard in consistency, and skin over the swelling was not pinchable. Uh, on anterior rhinoscopy, there was left nasal mass completely obstructing the nasal cavity. Nasal mass was, in, was sensitive on probi probing, Firm in consistency and bleeds on touch. Cotton wool test was, uh, there was decreased movement on left side. Tenderness in left maxillary and ethmoid region. On nasal endoscopy, there was uh, mass seen in left nasal cavity and no uh, extension to nasopharynx. There was decreased smell perception on the left side. Narrowing of the palpebral fissures due to edema. Uh, finger counting at 6 meter was same on both the sides and extraocular movements were normal. There was no nystagmus. Sensation of, over the face was present, bilateral. Uh, corneal reflex was present. Jaw movements were normal. Ear examination, bilateral tympanic membrane was intact. Tuning folk tests were within normal limits. Uh, uh, Dr. Are you, are you sure about the V2 not involved because... With this amount of skin involvement, usually the V2 is involved. The patient had actually increased pain. Okay. So there was no loss of sensation over the face. Right, right. I think, uh, Kirti, you, you, I'm reminded of my MS days when you present. And I think there must be an evolution when you're presenting as a case for an MCH. We assume that you know a lot of things, right? It's not like an MS examination, like cotton wool test and that. What, what if there is no airflow? Am I going to be really worried about that? Is it going to change my management? So, so think like an oncologist here. One thing that I want you wanted, the patient has dacryocystitis. You need not say that I have pressed the medial canthus and pus comes out of it. You, are in, you have done your MS or you have done your MDS. You are a master. Right? If you tell me dacryocystitis, I must believe you that it is there. Right? That is one. Number two, this is a big tumor with the swelling in the medial part of the eye. I have a feeling it's going to the skull base. It's a good idea to sort of, you know, complete your examination with an examination of the cranial nerves, right? So you must mention that all other cranial nerves are intact. The patient is coming to a specialist like you, right? Suppose the patient has a second primary in the larynx and you miss it. An MBBS doctor can miss it. An MS guy can miss it. But you as an MCH candidate, you shouldn't. So you must complete your examination by saying, rest of ENT, my larynx. I've done an endoscopy. I've seen the larynx. Because you're a head neck surgeon, right? And so that shows that you are a complete, complete uh, head neck surgeon. You, you are able to see the person in, in totality, right? So I, if I were an examiner, I wouldn't be saying like counting of fingers and touching and feeling. You say fifth is normal means I know fifth is normal, okay. right? So concise, crisp, present at the level of an MS guy. You're like a colleague. You're not an MS student standing on the other line and the examiner smirks and drinks coffee and puts marks over there. That time has changed, evolved. Go ahead. You're doing it very well. Uh... 
<clears throat> intraoral examination mouth opening was adequate there was 4 into 2.5 cm ulcerative proliferative growth in left upper alveolus and heart palate uh, as uh, extending from right lateral inside incisor to left last upper molar actually this is hanging just so the hard palate is in what the soft palate is free. Yes, sir. And the anterior part is crossing the midline. It's going yes. to the other side, right? Yes, sir. Excellent. Uh, present uh, for uh, case summary: a forty-six-year-old female presented with swelling in left cheek for four months, involving medial canthus for one month, associated with skin ulceration and epiphora. She had complaints of left nasal obstruction for three months associated with nasal discharge, decreased smell sensation, and left oral ulceration for two months. On examination, there was uh, irregular firm heart indurated tender swelling in uh, uh, left side of the cheek uh, involving left nasal cavity, maxilla, uh, involving medial canthus superomedially with skin ulceration near and uh, left nasal ala. Left nasal cavity was completely obstructed with pale reddish mass, uh, with sticky mucoid discharge, decreased smell perception, and 4 into 2.5 centimeter ulcerative proliferative growth was present in left upper alveolus. Should I oh, continue with this cancer? Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Are you okay with us interrupting you or do you want questions at the end of it? No, no, sir. Okay, it's go ahead. Uh, this is an axial contrast enhanced computed tomography of nose and paranasal sinus, which shows that there is a soft tissue density in uh, left nasal cavity involving the maxilla, ethmoids, and the anterior wall is eroded. And in the Second line, last section, there is erosion of the posterior, posterior, posterior wall also. However, the mass does not uh, extend into the infratemporal fossa, does not involve the pterygoids or uh, muscles. There is a erosion of the heart pal upper alveolus uh, up to the midline, we can see in the scans. And <clears throat> nasopharynx is free. Uh, pterygoids are free. The coronal scans shows uh, again a soft tissue density in the left nasal cavity involving the ethmoids. The frontal look free. Uh, in CT scan, there is no obvious erosion of the or no obvious involvement of the orbit. Extraocular muscles are seen, and uh, maxilla is so involved. What kind of uh, window it is? It is a bony window or soft tissue window? You should also comment on. This is a bony window and in the sagittal scans we can see uh, uh, there is involvement of the, actually this has shifted, there is involvement of the maxilla, the skull base is free, there is no extension to the skull base and the, there is no involvement of the sphenoid sinus. Uh, it is a anterior um, tumor mainly. Oh, nasopharynx is free, free vertebral muscles are free. Nasal bone, nasal bone. Uh, sir, just... The nasal bone, uh, it is uh, ipsilateral side of the nasal cavity is involved. However, there is no erosion of the septum as we saw in the axial cuts also. This is a MRI axial scan, T1 with contrast. Uh, there is a ISO intense to the um, ISO intense mass with contrast enhancement seen in region seen in uh, left nasal cavity involving ma uh, ethmoids, maxilla. And there is obvious extension to the extraocular muscles uh, involving the orbit. Uh, nasopharynx is free. Uh, no involvement of the infratemporal fossa. Septum is... Uh, Dr. Kirti, you cannot comment on all the extent on only axial scan. Yes, sir. Right? The axial scan is very good for 
inferior extent and the superior extent. A coronal cut is good for uh, looking at that what is the involvement of the medial orbital wall and the other areas. You should you should take it in totality and then see where it is involved and then you should comment on it. Just and I mean uh, taking it to the next level that you can comment on all this. It is yeah. being seen, but uh, if it is better that if you uh, comment on T1, T2, and then T1 contrast, and then uh, axial coronal and sagittal, and then you comment that in what is being seen exactly in that scan. Dr. Kirti, I saw that you have done both investigations. You know, if you are, if you ask head neck surgeons, what would you prefer for an MRI? Many other time you get an answer that we will do both. We'll do both the CT scan and MRI. So can you tell us how, why did you do an MRI and how did it help you here? Sir, uh, you to be, see, whenever we in, talk, now we say India is a poor country and all Indians brothers. So there is a responsibility to save resources as well. But here I think you are justified in doing this. But if you can just explain it to the 60 odd speakers, why you did it, you know, it will be great. It will be very graceful of you. Sir, uh, in this uh, particular case, uh, CT and MRI both are important. They are complementary investigations. A CT scan to see the bony involvement, erosion or expansion. And uh, MRI to see the op orbit, optic nerve, muscles, the brain, the uh, dura involvement. All, for all these we need, uh, and also the soft tissue extent of the tumor as a whole or a perineural invasion if, uh, to see the foraminas. All, for all these things, we need a MRI in this case. Since it is an extensive tumor, not only limited to the maxilla, had it been only limited to maxilla, we could have uh, skipped the MRI maybe, but in this case... We Will it help you to distinguish between inspissated secretions. Will it reveal the true yes, extent sir, of the yes, tumor sir. in an MRI? So yes. as a surgeon, isn't that the most important thing that you would want? Your first question is like most paranasal sinus tumors are treated with surgery and you're already thinking in terms of surgery, right? Yes. Yes. So what does a surgeon want to know? He wants to assess his enemy first, right? Yes. And that is where, you know, MRI stands out from the rest. It will give you tissue delineation. Orbital floor erosion scan will tell you, but if there is a gross erosion, even an MRI can tell you. An MRI can even tell you better if the orbital fat is involved or if the muscles are involved. For the orbit, it may be, as you said, I will use that cliched word called complementary. That is what you're all told in your MS days. When an examiner asks, bolo, complementary. So that is exactly what it is, and you're right. Okay. As a surgeon, what are the areas that you really want to assess? in order to assess operability. Did you hear Dr. Kesari say that if you leave disease behind, you have done a grand biopsy, you have not done a surgery, right? Yes, so in sir. order not to do a grand biopsy and proceed with a good surgery, you need to know where the tumor is. So what are the areas specifically if you tell 60 of us, where exactly am I looking at? You know, Where if the tumor goes, I'm not going, I'm not ready for surgery. So tell me, Kirti, what would you look for for signs of inoperability? So, uh, cavernous sinus involvement, uh, bilateral no. optic nerve involvement, prevertebral muscle involvement, and uh, prevertebral would be a long way off. If it was uh, the larynx, I would say yes. Extensive uh, intracranial extension. Or, extensive uh, intracranial extension. Would you want to stratify it further, like dural, extradural, intradural? Intradural. Uh, Intradural, the outcomes are really bad after surgery. It's not that you can't do it. Yes, you can still proceed with surgery. It's not inoperable. A frontal lobe can be taken out. But the outcomes, there is an international uh, uh, consortium uh, study which with over 30 participants said, if it goes into the dura, the outcomes are bad. But it doesn't prevent you from doing a surgery. What else? Skull base. Yeah, skull base. Uh, so the internal carotid artery involvement or the perfect nasopharynx uh, nasopharynx involvement clival erosion Excellent. so nasopharynx is, is is a strict no no if it goes into the nasopharynx you would not go for it if it's a carotid invasion you won't go. would you go for bilateral jugular there are no nodes here but if there were large big nodes 
bilateral jugular involvement is it a strict con not a very strict contraindication not a strict contraindication we can do if we can preserve the external jugular in that case if Correct. possible you are right do you want to go if it's a extensive soft tissue involvement extensive soft tissue involvement is a relative contraindication if but with the advent of free flaps uh, we can cover large areas so that is a relative contraindication not infra temporal the... fossa Infra temporal fossa, so high infra temporal fossa is a in relative contraindication. In a maxilla, is it? In oral cavity, I would agree. Sir, uh, it, it doesn't make it stage I, four B. It is now operable, I guess. Make it T four B. Correct. It is operable, but it is borderline resectable to achieve uh, like uh, the negative margins with. Uh, depending on how much is the involvement uh, to achieve negative margins with surgery, whether possible or not, that can be. So if uh, you look at AGCC, sir. it still doesn't make it T4B. Yes, sir. Yeah, because when you're operating on the maxilla, you're right there. But to go from below to up, when you're doing an oral cavity and you're going to the ITF, it's, it's a different perspective. For maxillary sinus tumors, it, it doesn't contribute, it doesn't, it is not inoperable or doesn't no. constitute T4B, right? So, so you have pretty much covered everything, right? Thank you. Uh, Kirti, uh, does histology play a role in deciding your resection in some part if it is involved? Yes, ma'am, histology does play a role, uh, whether we have to characterize whether it is an epithelial tumor or a non-epithelial tumor, and uh, in undifferentiated carcinomas, uh, uh, generally, uh, upfront surgery is not uh, preferred in such extensive cases. Uh, adenoid cystic or uh, squamous cell carcinoma with epithelial tumors, we can uh, surgery is the mainstay of the treatment. So we haven't come to the histology yet, right? Uh, I'm curious to know what what what, what is this? Okay, okay yes. Go this ahead. is uh, this is squamous cell carcinoma. Go ahead, go ahead. You present. Continue. Mm -hmm. I have a question, uh, Dr. Kirti. You, you mentioned that the patient had a history of uh, tobacco uh, since last 15 years. So before seeing the scans, how would you differentiate whether the disease is going from old cavity to the sinus or it is the sinus which is coming into the old cavity? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, but since the uh, extent of the maxilla involvement is much more than the oral cavity, and it is extending to the orbit also. So in this case, we can say that it is a maxillary, probably a maxillary origin. Uh, but uh, the patient vice versa can, can also happen. The also before the oral symptom in your history. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely yeah. So signs and symptoms play a very important role, as you already mentioned in your history, that his prime concerns her five concerns were about the nasal cavity. That is the reason that that hints, of course, it, it, it would not say completely because of uh, old cavity or sinus origin, but it will hint towards sinus because even your old cavity cancer can go to orbit, it becomes inoperable. Yes. So they are two completed, they do uh, 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 different ball games, which, which will give you hints in your history only. Very true. Please, please go ahead. Uh, so my diagnosis after the biopsy and scans is uh, squamous cell carcinoma left maxilla CT4A N0 M0. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, is it M0? Did you do the CT scan? Uh, okay. uh, we had done a CT scan thorax, sir. Uh, since already we had done two investigations and patient was not affording for PET CT. So we had done a CT thorax in this patient. Why would you even think of a PET CT here? Um, no, uh, not in squamous cell, but in uh, non-epithelial cancer where incidence of distant metastasis are higher. In those cases, we can uh, we need to go for PET scan. This this hasn't even gone to the nodes as it. It's a locally yes. aggressive disease. Yeah, it right? is a locally it aggressive. Sort of pushes resources further by doing a PET scan. It's probably but, uh, not oh, just right? So just for my knowledge, a chest X-ray and ultrasound of women would have been good enough. I mean, uh, to me, if there is no other symptoms, you, you have already lived out cough and other thing. Uh, we have part, done a non-contrast CT thorax, sir. Right. Right. Okay. Good enough. 
So this is an M0 T4A locally advanced maxillary sinus tumor, yes. Yeah, so you, you said it is clinically N0. So that is clinical radiologically N0. Clinical radiologically. What are the levels of neck have you palpated? Uh, what is a first sentinel or first um, uh, node for um, maxillary cases? So the upper jugular and retropharyngeal. Correct. Uh, upper so retropharyngeal can only be assessed with radi no. radiology. You, you can't put a finger into the retropharynx, right, Kirti? Yes, sir. Right. right. So, Kirti, so, even if it's a very extensive disease on the picture, uh, what was the best part? What is the best uh, good part of this disease? And what is a not so good part of this disease? Ma'am, uh, the pros, the good part is that it is an anterior disease. Uh, there is no posterior yes. involvement, no skull base involvement. Uh, so this is one good thing and the general condition of the patient was good. So these two things were good. And the mouth opening was okay? The mouth, mouth opening, opening was, okay. was good, yes ma'am. There was okay. no and no nodes. So it's just yes. a locally advanced disease. And bad point, uh, squamous cell is an aggressive histology. Mm. So this is one thing and orbit extensive. Uh, there is orbital involvement that is also bad in the sense that patient will have to undergo uh, extensive surgery. No notes. Extensive, extensive. No notes. Uh, sorry, sorry ma'am. There is also some uh, quite extensive uh, skin and soft tissue uh, skin involvement. And skin soft. involvement. Yeah. So, um, in a maxillary cancer, uh, what are the prognostic uh, factors you feel these are the good signs? Uh, these are good prognostic factors. Ma'am, uh, histology of the tumor. Uh, orbital right. involvement is a bad prognostic uh, sign. Uh, okay. Lymph nodes involvement are bad prognostic features. And uh, tumor differentiations. Tumor de grade of tumor differentiation. Orbital extension does not confer bad prognosis. It is no, mutilating. No. It's mutilating. Yeah. Survival doesn't fall. The survival, see, the more posterior you go, survival drops. Yes, Orbit, we are worried because it's a vital organ, right? And it's it's close to your heart. If you tell a patient, have you seen their reaction when you tell them? Yeah. I go, it's morbid, right? Yeah. But skull base, infratemporal fossa, where you know you are operating in closed spaces, mostly getting margins around that at the skull base is a challenge in infratemporal Nodes are a bad prognostic indicator, right? And sir, so skull base, the central skull base is more uh, problematic if it is involving the central skull base, especially the Correct. spinal and clivus. Correct. More posterior. You may reflect the bone and maybe a part of dura. Correct. Less than five millimeter, but posteriorly, it's it's impossible to Correct. get up. So, so, so now we are curious to know again, Kirti, what did you do with this patient? Uh, so we did a. Uh... Uh, total maxillectomy with ethmoidectomy with the uh, uh, and uh, extended maxillectomy. Uh, sir? The word would be extended maxillectomy. Extended maxillectomy, yes, with orbital accentuation. Orbital? You said the orbit is not involved and then you went on to take out the orbit? Yes, sir, extraocular muscles are involved in MRI. So that is orbital accentuation. Is it yes, sir. the muscles? Are involved so it's involving uh, I, I missed that on the scan maybe yeah. you're right Carry on. Just, it was not very evident on the CT but this part of the uh, I would look at it on a coronal cut that is when you see all the recti muscles if it's still in the many a times you take a surgical decision if you can take yes. it yes. off the periosteum yes, you don't need a centimeter margin there yes sir, yes, sir. Yeah. If, we, uh, if we see the, uh, uh, during interop that uh, there is just a limited periosteal and uh, periorbital involvement or we can send the orbital fat for frozen. If it is negative, then we need not do uh, orbital excentration. But in this, we uh, needed to counsel the patient uh, for orbital excentration. And however, when the patient was operated, there was extraocular muscles involved. And so we went ahead with orbital excentration. Dr. Kirti, uh, T2 images of MRI always overestimates a disease. 
So is there any way in which you, because this is a very sensitive matter, the disease is just reaching the periorbital fat. Is there any way you'll be able to merge two images like STIR, T1, T2, and discuss with radiologists to find out whether actually the extraorbital content is important yes. or not? Yes, sir. In cases of doubt, since the patient in history does not have, and also examination does not have any uh, eye symptom except for the epiphora. So this was, uh, uh, but on the MRI, when we saw, we had discussed with the radiologist and even it correlated intra-op in this case, particular case. So there are uh, some sequence like fat set. Absolutely. Uh, yes, fat. Yes, sir. So images and fat. Yes. Yeah, so that's why I said, you know, MRI is probably a great tool for a maxillary sinus tumor. So the radiologist can actually use gadolinium to, to look for enhancement uh, of tumor. And they use a sequence called the, uh, it's called diffusion weighting. Diffusion so diffusion weighted, weighted sequences, usually tumors, would, sort of there's a restriction of uh, gadolinium going into that. And that's a good way of delineating whether the, but again, at the end of it, it's the involvement of the orbis, orbital periosteum at the time of surgery that will probably guide you. If it is free, yeah. there is there is no role for taking out the orbit in these patients. So even in when limited said, you know, I have been emphasizing so much on, on preserving the orbit. So, Kirti, any, any, anything that you know of whereby people have tried to preserve the orbit, any other strategies to preserve the orbit? Yes, sir. There are... A uh, couple of studies where show that uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy, even in uh, stage three and four maxillary squamous cell cancers have played a great role in uh, first uh, prognosticating the patient. Those who have partial response, even a partial response to new adjuvant chemotherapy have a better prognosis. And in around 70 to 80% of the cases, they uh, could preserve the orbit. So there was a study by Hannah et al. in 2011 and again by Hannah et al. in 2021. Uh, also, there was a uh, study by the Tata group. It was an unresectable squamous cell cancers. No, I was talking uh, about orbit, the orbit preservation. Huh, it was not of the orbit preservation with the endpoint, but when they saw... Okay, the, so please focus on the question, right? Uh, so, like, if you ask to talk about a cow, you say, I'm going to tie the cow with the rope, and then you go on describing about the rope. Nahi, nahi. That would put you in a bad light. Here, the question was on orbit preservation using non-surgery. Like larynx, we have. You're very well aware of the RTOG 9111 studies and all that. But are you aware of any study where the orbit is trying to, you're trying to preserve the orbit using, say, NACT. You just mentioned NACT. Are you aware that people are trying? Because, you know, you must be curious here. Is there any way I can save the eye? Have you ever went into, gone into literature and seen if there are any studies? Yes. There are, there are. Okay, so yes. there are studies. And it has been going on for a long time. This is just for your information. You can go and dig out the papers. I'm doing it spontaneously. So maybe I don't have all literature at hand right now. But 93, even uh -huh. in the 90s, uh, people like Gary Clayman, and Helmut Gepford, they try to give induction chemotherapy and reduce the tumor, move it away from the orbit, save the. But the problem is to get a functional eye after NACT procedures, it was very rare to get a functional eye. Uh, later, 2002, 2003, uh, the, from Denver, there was a group which with 60 patients treated with NACT. They found that 40% of 38, 40% of their patients did not have a functional eye. So even if you preserve the eye, it, you would be required to radiate that eye late, right? So what happens if you radiate the eye? So it can uh, result in painful eye, uh, which is a... Absolutely. Cataracts are better. You can put in a glass lens there, but a painful red eye is a dangerous sequel. It's a painful sequel. And second would be diplopia. Yeah. No, you may remove the orbital floor, and if, the re if your reconstruction isn't good, your two eyes would be at two levels. And diplopia is a disabling condition. The patient would come and say, I would rather keep my eye closed or patched to see with the other eye. So that is exactly. one problem. Exactly. And 10% so of them lost their eye. In that, that study was by uh, Imo Lee from Denver. Okay, so 
nobody really enjoyed doing that. So that is why we are stuck there with, with NACT. It's a very sensitive issue, isn't it? Preserving the eye. Yes, so go ahead. Don't just take out the eye at the drop of a hat. Yes. Right. It is very go good. Uh, I mean, uh, psychologically, it's a very, uh, I mean, denting for the patient to remove an eye. And if we can give epis, uh, one or two cycle of NACT, it's maybe the, more the, time. The author is uh, Imola, from, Imola Denver, yes. from Denver. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, please. But sir, uh, this uh, even if you uh, preserve the eye, at least the patient will have the cosmesis. Even if it is uh, not functioning, uh, the uh, patient, uh, I mean, uh, rather, rather than having an ugly cosmetic deformity of losing the eye, if we are able to preserve the eye, even if it is not functional, I think uh, that is uh, like the patient will uh, definitely agree with uh, the uh, that uh, at least I you agree, preserve. I agree, Doctor Meher. Yeah, but for the globe, I think you know there there is a big role for prosthetics here. Right. Nowadays, you can really good centers can make eyes which borrow the compare the colors. You know, map the color from the other eye. That they is can do a pretty good job. That is definitely true, but that is very costly affair. Like Correct. what we have patients like in, in Mucor, we almost removed 40 patients uh, 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 with Mucor having orbital involvement. We removed the eye, but uh, not more than two patients could afford the prosthetic eye rest. All of them are actually without. Yeah, good point. Is the, good point. Uh, so any pictures of your surgery, like what you have done? How did you reconstruct or did you need reconstruction? So uh, I have not put up the pictures actually, but we reconstructed with a free anterolateral thigh flap. So if you look, what were the goals of your reconstruction here? So goals of reconstruction are oronasal separation. Uh, gen, uh, then the we have to cover the eye. Uh, the general goals of reconstruction are uh, dentition, oronasal separation, uh, orbital support, uh, the, then a cosmetic uh, bulk of the cheek. Uh, the She's a 46-year-old lady. Yes, sir. So would a single flap with an ALT, do you think, uh, suppose you had the expertise, you had like five plastic surgeons working under Dr. Kirti Kandelwa, all brilliant microvascular surgeons. So what would you instruct them? What do you want from them? Uh, sir, we would have in that case gone for a, at least a dental rehab with a bone yeah, uh, because composite uh, flap would have been done. Uh, maybe a iliac crest with uh, oblique muscle or a thoracodorsal artery flap, angular artery flap. So we had, uh, we would have uh, reconstructed the dentition part, and also uh, if we have too much expertise, then we can uh, support, uh, make a space for the globe so that the prosthetic eye also fits well. So. Yeah. It's important that you, the lip is also a functional unit, not just cosmetic. And here yeah. I see that if you take a margin on the tumor, half of the left upper lip goes as well, right? Yeah. So ideally you would need a combination of flaps here, probably staged surgery. Staged Being surgery. an advanced disease, you may not want to reconstruct everything in one go, but leave the sort of foundation there for, for future reconstructive surgeries. Maybe she will do well. It's only yes. a locally adv advanced tumor. It's not going to the pterygopalatine fossa. It's not going intracranially. It's not going nasopharynx. There are no nodes. But she may do well. So I think you know it's incumbent on everyone to get the patient back to her life. And Sir, uh, my, my question, so my question is that, uh, I mean, uh, from your expertise, would you like to give NSAT to this patient to try saving the eyes? Uh, or would you straight away go for uh, for this particular case? Since there is no evidence as of date today that NACT works and we don't have experience of NACT in trying to preserve that, I would stick to protocol. And if if the orbit periosteum is involved, indeed involved, we, we would take out the eye here as well. But these are, these are thoughts. When you're thinking as a group, I think these are interesting areas where, where we can sort of venture out. Another point of view is that uh, even if you give new adjuvant chemotherapy, there will be 30 to 40 percent who will progress on chemotherapy. Perfectly fine. You're right. So in that, that scenario, 
in that scenario your borderline disease will become inoperable but it has to be done under 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 surveillance under supervision that goes for any kind of nact not just for the orb uh, dr kirti another question uh, uh, you we are talking about reconstruction before that uh, did we address the neck for this case and if oh yeah great question the yeah. extent of neck dissection <clears throat> sir uh... we had done a selective neck dissection although in n0 uh, nccn does not recommend the neck dissection uh, elective neck irradiation is done but uh, since a tumor was going to the oral cavity so and it was involving half of the uh, palate on the same side we had done a selective neck dissection for this case rather i would uh, differ from dr kirti here because the big area the skin is involved here Skin is rich in lymphatics, plenty of dermal lymphatics there. So having crossed the midline on that side, even on the palate, you have crossed the midline. I would prefer a bilateral neck dissection. Uh, we had sent level one A for frozen. Uh, that was negative, so we did not do so a. What is the lymphatic neck? drainage of maxilla in that case, sir? If you say you have sent a one A for uh, uh, frozen, and based on that. you are basing that you are not be doing neck dissection on the right side what is the lymphatic drainage of there are two pathways of uh, yes sir the, uh, there are matlab from the nasal route and the, the either the first echelon node uh, is the second uh, upper deep cervical node and the retropharyngeal node so, is a pathway so one pathway will go through retropharyngeal to level 2 that is jugodiagnostic and second pathway will go from your palate to submandibular gland so your 90% of your nodes will be in 1b and 2 so if sir is saying disease is crossing the midline that means it is involving the another part of gingiva that means it might go through the retropharynx or it will go through submandibular gland if it is going through submandibular buccal nodes then your 1a will come into action but if it is going through retropharynx then your 1a might not be the central node where you will which will indicate that 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 the nodes is crossing the on the other side of the neck but then uh, matlab like in this case uh, since it was a ipsilateral maxilla involvement ipsilateral nasal cavity involvement so uh, <clears throat> and the oral cavity with a midline just a midline uh, extension so More preferred pathway could have been an oral route, so that is why we had sent one for it. So you have the histopathology of this. So, <clears throat> the, the, it was consistent with the squamous cell. Uh, N zero. It was N zero. Yes. So do you so, have, he, do you know about the randomized control trial uh, about um, where? non squamous histology or squamous histology oh. where the two groups where the neck dissection was done and then in another group the neck dissection was no, not done randomized controlled trial done by abu and <laughs> in sino nasal cancer sir yeah maxillary sinus yeah. uh i know of uh, msk cc study where uh, there were 927 patients but it was a retrospective study where they saw that uh, in advanced sinonasal cancers there was a benefit of uh, elective neck dissection in uh, adjunct to the, uh, the elective neck irradiation also in uh, more than p3 tumors more than 4 cm tumors that had an impact on uh, uh, local matlab uh, the disease control not the overall survival was not documented so that is the basis of nccn guidelines so nccn guidelines says elective neck irradiation is to be an advanced disease so yes. very important point correctly said that it does not it may not impact oral survival but it impacts the regional recurrences so regional recurrences almost reduced by half and more importantly even if the salvage is to be done the salvage was able to be done in 58% of the cases in which the patient who received irradiation while those who do not receive irradiation only 34% would be salvaged please go on kitty um, as hitesh uh, once uh, mentioned in any city especially in squamous cell carcinoma uh, we do not know the it's very unpredictable the, the response to any city 
So if it is an upfront resectable, then it's always better to go ahead with an upfront resectable and do not give uh, any CT. But uh, what are the histologies per se in a sinonasal uh, tumors, which actually responds to NECT, and we usually give NECT in those cases. Squamous cell, we know it's not uh, very, um, we do not have robust evidence on the response of NECT to squamous, but what are the other histologies, non-squamous, which actually uh, responds to NECT? neuroblastoma, undifferentiated, sinonasal, undifferentiated carcinomas, uh, Sinonasal undifferentiated carcinomas, uh, NACT works. It's also not very evident. Uh, CTRT works. CTRT. NACT in, in, in some cases they have seen in some cases, so it's not very evident that NACT will work in SNAC. This esthesio, yes, but esthesio, do you have any grading on esthesio which says ki, uh, it works more in this group and not in that group? Do you have any grading of esthesio? Yeah, grading. Uh... Uh, is uh, used for esthesia neuroblastoma, grade 1, uh, A, B, C, D. D is a Morita classification. A so that is, is clinical. I'm saying about pathological HIMS, which will decide on your NACT, which will, which will uh, tell you if this group of NACT, this group of pathological grading will, uh, you have to give NACT and this group will not. E53. Do you know any pathological grading for esthesia? No, ma'am. So, so that is the Hyams grading. Hyams grading. So Hyams grade three and four has got a very high incidence of this in meds. Uh, so usually we go ahead with uh, uh, NACT in three and four because the uh, the rate of this in meds are more. In Hyams one and two considered to be a bit low aggressive in histology uh, aggressiveness. So that's why we can uh, go. Uh, do uh, without NACT. But yes, uh, we decide on NACT on esthesia depending on both the HIMS as well as the Kaddish Morita classification. Kaddish yeah. And uh, anything more? I mean, any more histologies where NACT works? Oh, yeah. Mucosal melanomas? No, mucosal melanomas do not work NACT. Any more? You have the neuroendocrine carcinomas. Yeah, the sinonasal neuroendocrine carcinomas, not the undifferentiated carcinomas, but the neuroendocrine carcinomas. You have the small cell carcinomas. Any more, you know? Rhabdo also works, rhabdo myasal. Yes, yes, yes. Rhabdo NACT is actually the first line of modality, especially in kids, RMS, right? And uh, there is also a paper by Lisa Lisitra where they have seen the genomic sequencing of uh, adenocarcinomas. And do you know anything about that paper? Um, uh, in that, uh, they showed that uh, P53 and uh, P53 positive tumors had uh, better response to NACT. Than is there any um, division of that P53 which works better and which will not work with NACT? Wild type P53. Yes, yes, functional or wild type of P53 um, works with NACT, and the mutant P53 do not respond so much with NACT. Yeah. Okay. Kirti, uh, what are differential diagnoses you can think of uh, before doing a biopsy in this case? Uh, sir, uh... Since it is a short history, it, my differentials will include mostly malignant ones, can be squamous cell, adenocarcinoma, adenoid cystic carcinoma, or uh, uh, undifferentiated carcinoma. So uh, just... Uh... sinusitis, if... Uh, it will include only malignant ones. Okay, so just imagine this patient uh, you saw a week back and you she was absolutely all right. And in a week's time, you, you see such destruction happening in mid-nasal and maxillary area. What kind of disease you can think of? Midline NKT cell lymphomas. Absolutely. The spectrum is huge. The kind of histology that you would get in it. That is why we don't have protocols for many of these treatments yes. because some of them are so rare. Right? Most series on esthesioblastomas would be 10, 20, 30, not more than that. Uh, 
they are like salivary gland tumors and they are all clumped together and we form protocols based on that even salivary gland origin yes. right so that is what limits us from making protocols in maxillary sinus tumors so is that okay shall we conclude ah did you give adjuvant to this patient yes sir we gave okay. uh, uh, adjuvant tati ियलिटरीप and what about the palate palate we had given a uh, alt flap only their dentition part was not there but the oronasal separation was there okay. thank you thank you sir thank you thank you ma'am thank you dr asim can we conclude uh, thank you so much uh, thank you sir for this uh, wonderful session uh, and uh, since recently since 2018 onwards there have been several studies that have come on the maxillary sinus tumors specifically a lot of series from the md anderson and mskcc group and also few series from tata hospitals in india where we have studied about the role of the new adjuvant chemotherapies the work up and the management and therefore it is essential for everybody to please go through those specifically the people who will be appearing for the examinations i would like to request uh, dr arun if you would like to make any comment about the presentation of uh, kirti and how each of the examiners and also the other examiners and how each of them are going to grade yeah so kirti you have done a great job uh, i must admit you you have uh, gone through the case very well you know about the case that is the most important thing that an examiner will seek out the second is whenever you know whenever you are doing for going for your mch whenever you you don't learn from books at this point of time your textbook yes. days are over uh, you must refer journals on to you must be curious about the case you know all aspects of it uh, the surgery the reconstruction whether you need adjuvant or not like orbit preservation right and so that is where you would stand out and and please keep referring nowadays i think you know in the age of internet you don't have to go to a library to find out uh, recent literature and article so that should be your learning material that should be your like dr asim just said you know a lot of papers have come out maybe it's happening at such a pace that you know people we also miss out on on a lot of current so please make it a point this is the best time to to pick up on those the presentation was quite comprehensive and you did quite well and if you ask me like what did you ask me asim would i pass or is it She she is she. Definitely going to pass. Uh, we don't have any doubts about that. So any comments about her improvement that will be best. But definitely she is going to pass. Yeah. So that is why Kirti, I think you should keep current literature in hand whenever you are preparing for an area. Just go through. Keep a compilation with you of of all important literature that comes. I am sure with these with these um, programs that we have time and again people will be referring to various literature. Just jot it down. Go back home and refer to them. And that would put you in great standing. So well done, and, and, and thank you, sir. Thank continue. you, uh, Doctor Ravi. And thanks, Asim. Thanks to you for for such a. Uh, Doctor Asim, I mean Doctor Kirti did uh, uh, very well. Uh, she presented the uh, case very well, and uh, she could answer all the questions uh, of all the panelists. Uh, and I think uh, she did a uh, wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Doctor Amit. Anything which specific you would like to add upon to? Uh, thank you, Kiti, for the presentation, and uh, thank you, Dr. Amit, for the wonderful talk. And I thank you all for joining us today. Uh, next, we will be meeting on twenty-first of April, and the topic will be on the oropharyngeal carcinomas. And the presentation is going to be by Dr. Sarvani Ghosh Lashkar. She is a radiation oncologist at Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. Uh, See you on twenty first. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.